Welcome. Today's presentation discusses the March 2022 notice of funding availability for the inaugural round of the multifamily finance notice of funding availability, otherwise referred to as the supernova. My name is Lynn Jones and I am a section chief over the climate investments branch overseeing one of the supernova programs IIG. Joined with me today is my peer Hector Leva, who is the section chief over the supernova programs. Additional members of our management staff are presenting today, as well as our research and data specialist. For those of you watching for the first time, we welcome you. For those rejoining us from sessions you previously visited, whether in person or by webinar, we welcome you back. As promised, we have included additional content that we have compiled over the last few workshops to be able to provide you with the most comprehensive presentation for this recorded segment. We would be remiss if we didn't take a moment to thank those who have been in attendance at any of our previous workshops held over the last week and a half. Thank you for contributing to our content and for raising questions that are beneficial for us all. We look forward to getting responses to those questions out to you shortly. As you can imagine, there are quite a few. Lastly, it has been a busy year for the department and we have not slowed yet. I want to thank our management staff for their continued support and dedication to the mission of promoting safe, affordable homes and vibrant, inclusive and sustainable communities for all Californians. Since this is a closed session recording, many of the housekeeping rules do not apply. However, we have a lot of content to cover in this presentation, so let's briefly discuss timing and objectives. The presentation is currently slated to run approximately 90 minutes today. Our goal is to assist you in providing the information you may need to help make your application submission successful. The beauty of a recorded session is your ability to pause and take notes or jot down questions. If you have questions, we encourage you to submit them to the supernova mailbox at supernova at hcd.ca.gov, where we have a team of dedicated staff capturing and responding to those questions. With the amount of inquiries we are receiving, you can assist us in getting you a response quicker if you could please reference the guideline, NOFA, or UMR section along with your question. This will help our staff tremendously. Additionally, the first frequently asked question document is in its final stage of routing and will be available on our webpage by May 20th of 2022. Our staff are continually updating the content and a refreshed FAQ will be made available weekly until the application due date. So please stay tuned and check the frequently asked questions before submitting your question as it may have already been answered. We wanted to provide you with some of the leadership team who, we, who will be working with you through this NOFA cycle. Craig Morrow is our branch chief over the SuperNOFA AB434 group. Hector Leva is the section chief over the Supernova AB434 group. Lynn Jones, myself, is the section chief over the Climate Investments Branch. And program managers reporting to the Supernova group are Shirley Chavez, who leads Cerna Multifamily, Tarsi Hodge, who leads MHP, Sherry Kurt, who leads IIG, Becky Moe, who leads VHHP, Conant Radcliffe, who leads IIG, and Anthony Ramirez, who leads MHP. We have a very robust agenda today. The layout of our presentation resembles many workshops we have done in the past. However, please know there is a lot of information to cover given that four programs are now consolidated into one notice of funding availability. So today, members of our management team will cover the various topics noted above, and they will expand on and provide details for all of the following sections. Hector is up next with what is AB 434. Becky will then cover threshold. Sean with CalVet will cover VIP supportive services. Gina will cover rating and ranking, otherwise known as scoring. Shirley will cover feasibility. And Conant will round us out with application submittal and resources or and our program called SNAP, which is our SuperNOFA application portal. Thank you for your time, and I want to bring up Hector next. Thank you, Lynn. I'd like to echo your comments about our six program managers and their teams and their commitment to the successful implementation of this legislation, creating a singular program. 
In the following slides, I will be discussing the legislation and the associated programs. The purpose and goal of this legislation, department objectives, what has been accomplished thus far, the NOPA, funding cycle limits and caps, what's currently in process and our next steps, hot topics we've identified during the webinars and workshops, as well as inbox questions we received, and of course, more importantly, the dates that matter to all of you for this funding cycle. Please note, as I provide you information in this section, you will hear these topics covered in more detail later on today. First, let's start with what the law is. The California legislature passed and the governor signed into law Assembly Bill 434 on September 28, 2020. It authorized HCD to update numerous multifamily programs administered by the department, releasing a super NOFA with available funds in the programs I am about to list. This was meant to increase efficiency, creating a more structured schedule and allowing developers to truly tailor their proposed projects on the actual funds needed. Supernova allows applicants to have a one stop shop for funding. In addition to the multifamily housing program going forward known as MHP, the programs impacted are the Veterans Housing and Homelessness Program, VHIP, the Joe Cerna Jr. Farm Workers Housing Grant Program, Cerna, the Transit Oriented Development Program, TOD, the Infill Infrastructure Grant Program, IIG, and the Housing for a Healthy California Program, HHC. For this first funding cycle, funds are only available for MHP, VHIP, CERNA, the multifamily portion, and qualified infill projects if submitting requests for IIG funding in the SuperNOVA. Please note, the CERNA program will release a separate NOVA for a single family funds later on this year, in addition to the IIG program releasing a NOVA for qualified infill, infill areas. This SuperNOVA and its applicable guidelines are intended to advance the state's goal of creating 2.5 million homes by 2030, according to the 2022 statewide housing plan, and in particular, assist in producing more than 1 million homes needed for Californians experiencing homelessness and people with low and very low incomes. Additionally, the department identified the following state policy objectives. Providing funding through multiple department funding sources to assist in creating more affordable housing in all regions of the state, taking into account climate smart housing, transit oriented developments and targeting specific populations. The way we accomplish this is reducing the time for application review, award and construction. The four programs have been released under one NOFA and are streamlined um, for the four HC rental housing programs to align eligibility criteria, scoring, and releasing the funds allowing for a coordinated single application and award process. Additionally, one of the governor's top priorities is assisting individuals experiencing homelessness. AB 434 addresses that housing instability and provides funding for supportive services. HCD has also prioritized aligning with TCAC and SIDLAC regulations. There were differences in HCD requirements and those of TCAC and SIDLAC, including project types, population served, documentation and scoring. We anticipate the changes made will assist developers in being more successful in obtaining their tax credits. Last, AB 434 has provided an opportunity for the department to address inequities in state funding for historically excluded developers. We have incorporated changes based on feedback obtained during various stakeholder sessions. As a result, a new eligible sponsor developer defined terms were created for tribal entities, emerging developers, and community-based developers. These new sponsor types have additional opportunities to meet the minimum experience threshold requirements and include the following. They must have developed a minimum number of affordable housing developments, must have developed or managed affordable housing developments that target specific populations, or partner with more experienced developers to obtain that experience and possibly gain those scoring opportunities. For the complete list, please refer to MHP guidelines section 7303, the appendix A, which is located at the end of each program set of guidelines, and the application itself. Additional incentives I'd like to highlight the department is implementing this round are as follows. Tribal 
entities are eligible for an additional $25,000 per unit for all restricted units at 60% AMI and less. The projects proposed on sovereign tribal land lease agreements entered into would be for at least 50 years. There is a set aside for both tribal entities and emerging and community-based developers that I will go over shortly. And as outlined in the NOFA, there is an increase in the eligible developer fee for tribal entities who partner with experienced developers in the application process and are part of the final ownership structure. The department has worked for the past 18 months in aligning these four programs, culminating in the release of NOFA on March 30th, 2022. There are approximately $650 million available across all four programs as shown on the next slide. Streamlining the guidelines, one single application, and release of several state funding resources is one of many recent policy solutions implemented by HCD to help accelerate production so our community partners can more effectively and efficiently serve Californians. You will notice in the prog program guidelines, different colored text. Red font is applicable to all programs. Black font is program specific. One of the biggest hurdles many of our external partners have had, not to mention the difficulties our teams have had internally in reviewing applications, is the different definitions each program uses. Appendix A, again located at the end of each set of guidelines, outlines one universal list of defined terms. The guidelines have identified additional program specific defined terms, and you can identify each program guideline defined terms by the color they are, which are located on the first page of Appendix A. All programs now have aligned with MHP for minimum threshold criteria. There is program specific threshold criteria, such as veterans and VHIP, and those can be found in the DENOFA and the program specific guidelines. Becky, uh, one of our program managers, will be presenting that later on today. Rating and ranking, again, going forward known as scoring, has also been updated for all programs. There is one universal scoring matrix located in the NOFA that is consistent with MHP and will be presented by our research data specialist, Gina. A single application has been released on May 6, and it now has a document checklist in that application with one set of documentation requirements for all programs or potential funding sources. Please note that six teams have been assigned to AB 434 for application reviews and for those projects awarded the standard agreement execution. So let's go over a breakdown of the available funds for each program as identified in the SNOFA and first funding cycle. MHP has approximately $275 million available. VHIP has approximately $95 million available. The CERNA multifamily portion of the program has approximately $80 million available. And for those submitting a funding request to IIG and are a qualified infill project, there's approximately $200 million available for a total in this first funding cycle of $650 million. The NOFA released on March 30th, in addition to this to re the recently released application, has the full breakdown on how to calculate the eligible funds available for your project. The base loan limits on the slide shown what is available for 9%, 4%, and non-tax credit projects. These amounts reflect the maximum amount available for 60% AMI units or less. Loan limits are no longer calculated based on county, AMI, and bedroom size. The department has determined the loan limit will be calculated based upon the unit's level of income restriction. If requesting funding for more than one of these three programs, MHP, VHIP, or Sona Multifamily, the per unit funding request is limited to one designated program. For IIG QIPs, the funding amount is calculated based on the factors listed on the slide including bedroom count and number of units, the density, and their affordability. For additional clarification, the layering or stacking of these supernova funds on the same unit is not permitted. If you are requesting funds for more than one supernova program, they must be on separate units. 
Additionally, there are three opportunities listed in the NOFA where a sponsor can increase the available per unit loan limit by $25,000 per unit. Even if you meet all three opportunities listed, there will only be one $25,000 per unit increase. These opportunities are as follows. The first is an application that is one of the eligible entity types listed in MHP guidelines section 7303A and includes but is not limited to a joint venture partnership LLC between a sponsor meeting minimum experience requirements and an emerging developer. For the purposes of the per unit increase, a tribal entity is considered an emerging developer. Additionally, the defined term and requirements to qualify as an emerging developer can be found in Appendix A. Eligible projects located in a high or highest resource area who meet the requirements to be awarded points in the universal scoring matrix state policy priorities category would be eligible to receive this $25,000 per unit increase. And last, the final available option to increase your per unit loan limit is available to projects targeting special needs populations in MHP or BHIP, where at least 45% of the restricted units target populations as identified in the BHIP guidelines, section 201, or Appendix A, the special needs population defined term. To ensure the department is not oversubsidizing projects and is equitably distributing awards to multiple projects, the NOVA has established the following caps. The first, previously awarded funds are subject to the per unit loan limits listed on the previous slide. The cumulative total cannot exceed the amounts listed. We strongly encourage you to contact your program representative on your existing awards to obtain the per unit amount on your existing award. For example, if you have received a prior AHSC or NPLH award, the per unit loan amount will count towards the cap of $150,000 for 9% tax credit projects, $200,000 for 4% tax credit projects, or $225,000 for non-tax credit projects. The second cap for this funding cycle. There is a total of $35 million that can be awarded in department funds on a single project. That includes any department funding for AB 434 programs and those not included in the AB 434 programs. This also includes previously awarded programs awarded prior to AB 434. The last cap for this funding cycle, each applicant or sponsor is limited to no more than $80 million in total awards in a supernova funding cycle, this first funding cycle of any type. So if a sponsor submits 10 applications and they are competitive and are awarded, that total amount awarded cannot exceed $80 million. There is an exclusion to that cap. If an application that's awarded and includes a sponsor or co-sponsor with an emerging developer or tribal entity, that award for that project would not count against the $80 million cap. The department also released Administrative Memo 21-06 in August of 2021, which established a limit of department awards per project of two loans and two infrastructure grants. A full listing of all affected programs can be found on the memo. So if you are awarded two of the three loan programs in AB 434, MHP, BHIP, or Shrenda Multifamily, you will have reached the department cap on loan awards for a project. Additionally, if you have received a prior department award that is one of the programs listed in that memo, those awards also count as part of the two loan or two infrastructure grant limit. Using the same example as above, if you received a prior AHSC award and it includes an AHD loan for the development of the project or an HRI, Housing Related Infrastructure Grant, those count against the two loan and two grant limit, or if you received a prior NPLH award, the NPLH loan that goes towards the development would count against the gap, but if you received a COSER, that would not count against the cap. Next, let's talk about Administrative Memo 2022-02, which was released on March 30th. 
The department's mission is to be a responsible steward of public funds. With this memo, HCD has identified a clear, fair, and comprehensive policy to disencumber awards from stalled projects, reallocating those funds to future rounds of funding and awarding to projects that evidence project readiness. This includes the following requirements, but for the full list, please head to the HCD website for all details listed in the memo, including impacted programs. The first, awarded projects must secure all funding within 24 months of the initial HCD award. Second, if an awarded HCD project loses their TCAC or SIDLAC tax credit allocation, that will result in the immediate disencumbrance of the HCD awards. Third, if a project is awarded and those awards were made on June 30th or earlier, a 24 month clock to start construction will begin on July 1st, 2022. For those projects that receive HCD awards on or after July 1st, 2022, that 24 month clock starts on that first award date. If subsequent HCD awards are made, that clock does not restart. It's based on the initial award date. The next policy we'd like to go over, and again, this is a department policy, not just specific to AB 434, is the negative points policy. This also was released on March 30th, 2022, and is known officially as Administrative Memo 2022-01. This policy is applicable to all state and federal funding programs administered by the department. So if you have an award with the Division of State Financial Assistance or the Division of Federal Financial Assistance, this applies to you and your projects. It also applies to any loan or grant. Through this negative points policy, the department ensures that the limited funding resources available are directed to sponsors and awardees that demonstrate an ongoing capacity to successfully operate and manage affordable housing developments as well as implementing those programmatic activities and requirements of receiving the award. Negative points will be assessed upon receipt of any application based on the criteria listed in the memo. I strongly encourage all applicants who have received an award for any project in any program to reach out to your partners and asset management clients. If you haven't already, to verify those awarded projects are meeting department and program criteria. On the screen, you'll see the email address of how to contact them, amcbranch at hcd.ca.gov. So let's go ahead and talk about set-asides for this first funding cycle. The first, a set-aside of no less than 5% of the total NOFA amount of $650 million will go towards the highest scoring tribal projects that also meet all minimum threshold requirements. For this round, that is approximately $32,500,000. Once that set aside is meant, any remaining tribal projects will go into the general pool and compete with the rest of the ranking projects. There's an additional set aside for emerging and community-based developers, which is no less than 15% of the total NOFA amount of $650 million. One third of that 15% is specifically reserved for emerging developers. I'd also like to call out that community-based developers may only compete in this set aside if they meet both of the following requirements. The first, they must maintain their corporate headquarters within 10 miles of the proposed project site or have three deed restricted affordable housing projects within 10 miles of the proposed project site and they have to directly provide at least two community benefit programs accessible to the general public within 10 miles of the proposed site. So let me recap that. You have to either be number one or number two, and you also have to provide those community benefit programs. To identify what we define as a community benefit program, please make sure you select the appropriate boxes in the application itself, which will then open up what a community benefit program is. Non-tax credit projects have a set aside of no less than 15% of the total amount of $650 million. MHP has a statutory requirement 
to set, it, to set aside 20% of the MHP funds specifically for senior projects. In this round, that's approximately $55 million. And last, let's go over the geographic requirements for distribution of total funds. Projects located in the South are targeted to have 44% of total funding. 28% of the total funds will be going and awarded to projects located in the North. 18% of the total NOFA funds will go to rural projects, qualified rural projects, and at least 10% of remaining funds will be discretionary applying to all remaining projects that are ranked highest. So let's talk about steps in process. There are six teams that will be assigned to AB 434, a total of 36 program representatives at a minimum, along with six program managers and section chiefs. Staff are currently involved in updating tools and processes to be more efficient in application reviews uh, and efficient in the award process itself. For those who have requested technical assistance, the department is providing this to the applicants who meet minimum qualifying factors as outlined in the NOVA. This TA service is specific to tribal entities, emerging developers, and community-based developers. Please note, tribal entities do not need to meet the minimum requirements listed. If you are any of the three entity types listed, please send an email to the SuperNOVA inbox with technical assistance in the subject line, adding information on the type of entity you are, a high-level overview of your project, the type of assistance you're looking for, and if you intend on submitting an application this round. Lastly, we have a working group researching the practicality of having one standard agreement and award per project. The department's goal is to have standard agreements executed shortly after the award. Your assigned representative during the review phase will also work with those applicants awarded through the standard agreement and organizational document review. I'd like to now take this opportunity to review items that have been brought up during previous workshops and webinars, or have had multiple inquiries related to these subjects via the email inbox. The first is sponsor authorizing resolutions. Sponsor authorizing resolutions by any sponsor or co-sponsor are not required at the application due date. Resolutions for any project um, are not required for the application due date. Once projects are awarded, the assigned representative will reach out and request resolutions only from those entities that have been awarded. The document checklist. Uh, we've received feedback that the document checklist is somewhat confusing and or misleading. So the easiest way we can say this is when looking at the application for this funding cycle, the Excel workload, there's a tab labeled document checklist. In that tab, you will see columns B, C, and D. Please ignore those. There's an X next to each one of those stating every single document is a required document. What we do want you to look at is column AN. AN will populate with a green check mark or a red X. This is all dependent on you as a sponsor or applicant entering information correctly on each of the tabs. As you enter that information, those green check marks or red X's will populate and that will help you identify when a document is required. The next top topic is project based vouchers and for the purposes of this conversation that includes any rental subsidies. Example of that are. Section 8. Um, HUD vouchers, batch vouchers, um, any local jurisdiction that provides any rental subsidy to subsidize the rent for your tenants. An enforceable funding commitment it is not required to meet minimum threshold requirements for any project. So if you submit a project that identifies a subsidy is going to be proposed or utilized, you need to enter that subsidy proposed subsidy information into the unit mix to identify the amounts that you're going to potentially be awarded or receiving. And the accompanying documentation that we would like to see is documentation from the source you intend to apply to and or will be hopefully awarded from should include the source, the amount, the term and potential renewal. So if it's a one unit bedroom at 30 percent, 
we want to ensure that what that source has as that subsidy matches what your unit mix shows. Now, that's to pass minimum threshold requirements. If you intend on receiving points or possibly receiving points during scoring, an EFC will be required for those project-based vouchers or rental subsidies. So just because you pass threshold doesn't necessarily mean you will receive points. One of the things we also want to clarify, an operating subsidy is not a project-based voucher slash rental subsidy. Operating subsidies are required to have a funding commitment in place at the application due date, are required to pass threshold, and need to be in place and have an EFC in place and pre presented in order to potentially receive those scoring opportunities. The next topic, there's been conversation and multiple questions related to prevailing wages. So the easiest way we can say this is this. If your project is seeking only MHP funding, or if your project has multiple funding sources and it includes MHP, prevailing wages are required because it's a statutory requirement for MHP. If your project does not include MHP, prevailing wages, whether they are required or not, would be determined based on the sources you list and your development sources. It is subject to the requirements of those potential development sources you identify and list. Technical assistance priority. As we get closer to the application due date of June 28th, um, we are filling up our schedule with consultations and technical assistance to the various requesters. What we are now going to start giving priority to is for those entities that are going to be submitting in this funding cycle. So if you are, that's why we'd like you to identify that in your request. And for those that are not, um, and you're just looking for general guidance on how to understand HCD programs or how to apply or potentially learn about programs, um, we won't schedule you up front just because we want to make sure that we address anybody that is submitting this round but we will contact you to schedule time to go over and give you an introduction to hcd or address whatever it is you are looking tech for technical assistance for next bullet point is the bifurcation of projects in the guidelines which is all four program guidelines and in our nofa there is now a prohibition on the bifurcation of projects if you have been awarded an award in any program, AB 434 or not, if it's any department funding source, the expectation of the department is you will build what you have been awarded uh, and scored in and were competitive in. If your proposal is to split that award, um, the department does not allow for assumption of awards or uh, assignment of awards. So if you're proposing a project that is, let's say, 200 units, and you realize that you need to get additional funding sources or it's just too big of a project and you need to split that into multiple phases, there will be a disencumbrance of that award, and you would have to reapply and be competitive for the multiple phases you are proposing. There's been also questions related to reporting dates and their requirements. So for the first one, let's talk about appraisals. If your project requires an appraisal to be submitted, there is no date requirement for the appraisal. What we do want to see as the is the following. The appraisal must match the subject property addresses and APNs. We also want to ensure that the value is fully identified and listed. If you have a market study or an environmental report, whether it's a phase one or phase two, the market study and environmental report both have date requirements. They must be dated no greater than 12 months of the application due date of June 28th. If you have a rehab and potentially the building was built prior to 1978, a lead-based paint, asbestos, or even a mold report will be required based on the project you are proposing. Last, if you have a concurrent TCAC SIDLAC application along with your HCD application, they can't be contradictory, meaning you can't submit to HCD as a 4% project 
and submit to a TCAC as a 9% project. If we identify that, your HCD application will be withdrawn. If you intend to submit to TCAC as a 4% or 9%, your concurrent HCD application must match that. Last, let's go into important dates for all of you that have passed and that are coming up. The first, as you all are aware, the NOFA was released on March 30th, 2022. The application was released on May 6th, which includes all documentation requirements in that document checklist located in the application itself. The SNAP portal went live on May 6th of this year. The SNAP portal for for all those who are familiar with HCD programs and haven't submitted before, it's similar to FARO or the FAST application portals. SNAP is our new version and is being used for the first time here with the AB 434 program. Important to all of you, application due date. It is June 28, 2022 at 4 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. If you hit the submit button at 401, your application will not be eligible. Please ensure you submit all documentation, including the application itself, no later than 4 p.m. on June 28th. And last, we expect to make award announcements in the month of November 2022, six months from now. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Becky, who will be going over the threshold portion of the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Hector. Good morning, everyone. My name is Becky Mo, and I will be conducting the presentation for Threshold. The areas of Threshold we will review today consist of five sections. They are eligible sponsor, eligible project, site control, program specific requirements, and submitting a complete application. This is a summary of some of the universal or program specific requirements and is now to be considered a complete representation of the entirety of the threshold. Please review the individual program guideline for complete information. During my presentation, I will introduce the threshold requirements that apply to all program involved in the supernova. And then I will dive into the program specific requirements. Let's start with the first threshold section, eligible sponsor. An eligible sponsor can be any of the examples listed on the slide. We recommend you review the guidelines for program specific requirements. In order to meet experience requirements, the sponsor shall demonstrate they have developed, operated, and owned at least four affordable rental housing developments, in short, RHD. The RHDs needs to have equivalent size, scale, and occupancy with the proposed project. The experience of controlled affiliated entities or principals may be included, but not the experience of non-management board members. To meet the requirements, tribal entities, community-based developers, and emerging developers may contract with an experienced entity. As Hector stated earlier, they could also qualify on their own as a sponsor to the site size. On top of the required sponsor experience, the sponsor shall demonstrate capacity to acquire, develop, and own affordable rental housing, as well as the capacity, ca capability to maintain direct and continuing control of the RHD throughout the full loan term. Sponsor shall be the recipient or co-recipient of the department's award of funds. Tribe or a tribally designated housing entity is any of the following. An Indian tribe or 
a tribally designated housing entity as defined under UCS Section 4103 of, of Title 25, or if not a federally recognized tribe, either listed in the Bureau of Indian Affairs Office of Federal Acknowledgement Petitioner List, or Indian tribe located in California that is on the contract list maintained by the Native American Heritage Commission for the purpose of consultation. Emerging developer is an entity, including a tribal entity, that has developed, owned, or operated at least, but not more than three affordable rental house affordable housing developments that are equivalent to the proposed affordable housing developments. The department may determine experience by evaluating the experience of the entity itself, the experience of senior staff within the organization, or contract with another entity that meets the experience requirements. Community-based developer is an entity, including a tribal entity, that has for the past 24 consecutive months been located and operating exclusively from or primarily in a low or moderate resources or high segregation poverty area, as that's in as designated in the most recently updated TCAT HCD Opportunity Area Map. The entity must have at least five years of experience in the delivery of culturally com competent services and or community development programs to low or lower income households in their community. See Appendix A and the application for further definition and the requirements of community-based developers. The second section of the threshold review is eligible project. If the project seeks funding from MHP, BIP, and CERNA program, it shall include a new construction or rehabilitation or the conversion of a non-residential structure to an RHD. We will discuss about IIG eligible project type in the next few slides. An eligible project should contain at least five or more units. Sponsor shall ensure not to commence construction, including demolition, at the time of application except for emergency repairs. The location should be accessible to resources in relation to the needs of the target population. Projects proposed by tribal entity applicants must be located in Indian country or located on fee or trust land within the state of California. Occupancy will be limited to tribal households to the greatest extent possible. Additionally, the project must demonstrate a compliance with fair housing requirements. To comply with Article 34 requirements, the project should either have Article 34 authority or provide an attorney opinion letter. The sponsor shall provide documentation Proving the project site is free from severe adverse environmental conditions. The sponsor shall ensure compliance with all applicable state and federal building codes and accessibility laws and standards. Depending on, depending on your project type, additional ADA compliance requirements may be necessary pursuant to MHP guidelines, section 7314. The project site must be physically capable of accommodating broadband service 
with at least a speed of 25 megabits per second for downloading and 3 megabits per second for uploading. And this is the minimum threshold requirement. The broadband service is also a scoring criteria, which will be elaborated during the scoring session. The third section is the set control. HCD requires the sponsor to maintain set control through the award date. The documentation must be in the name of the sponsor or an entity controlled by the sponsor. The organizational documents submitted with the application must clearly demonstrate sponsor control. As Hector had mentioned earlier, for the project developed in Indian country, if the site control is a ground lease, the lease agreement should last for not less than 50 years. And for the project developed in Indian country, an attorney's opinion regarding chain of title and current title status is acceptable in lieu of a title report. Proposals seeking MHB funding must qualify as one or more of the project types listed. Projects with special needs units must have an experienced sponsor, property manager, and lease service provider, which provides services suitable to the needs of the target population. Vacancies for the special needs units require referrals from the local coordinated entry systems. The application shall demonstrate a specific feasible supportive services plan for delivery and funding of those services, including identification of the lead service provider, service delivery partners, and funding sources. Additionally, Special needs project must demonstrate integration of targeted population with the general public and have no more than 49% of total units restricted through a department regulatory agreement occupied by persons with disabilities. To qualify under large family, Projects must have at least 25% of the restricted units with three or more bedrooms and an additional 25% of restricted units with two or more bedrooms. Senior projects need to restrict units to eligible households under applicable provisions of California Civil Code and Federal Fair Housing Act. Farm worker housing requires at least 25% of the units are available to agricultural households and at least 10% of the assisted units shall be at or below 30% AMI. At high risk involves a project that is currently an affordable housing type, housing project at risk of converting to market rate. In order to be eligible for IIG funding, a capital improvement project must be an integral part of the QIPs. A QIP should meet the following conditions as referenced in the IIG guidelines and Appendix A includes more than 15% of affordable units per health and safety code 50053, meet the net density requirements, be in an area designated for mixed use or residential development, and have a right of way, easement, or executed encroachment permit if offsite work is needed. The specific requirements for, for the CERNA programs are the sponsor must be a nonprofit. The project must contain assisted units to be occupied by, by the agricultural worker. 
and to the greatest extent possible, I need non-assisted units to be occupied by agricultural workers. Solar program assisted units shall be available to lower income households and the rent limit for initial occupancy for each, for each subsequent tenancy by a new eligible household shall apply to all assisted units. Project funding may be limited based on the presence of fund workers in the county in which the project is located. The funding limit per county is based on the most recent U.S. Census of Agriculture as defined in each NOFA. Projects seeking big funds should restrict the greater of 25% of the total units in the project or 10 units to VIP assisted units and reserve at least 50% of the assisted units to extremely low income veterans and 60% of the units reserved for ELI veterans needs to be supportive housing. Other than the occupancy requirement, the sponsor should provide a detailed supportive services plan at the time of application. For project with assist, assisted units, other than supportive housing units, sponsor shall utilize an organization to provide resident services coordination who has at least 24 months experience in providing the services in publicly assisted affordable housing. The sponsor must demonstrate confirmation of local need for the project by including letters from local VA office and local continuum of care. The project shall also ensure compliance with disabled veterans business enterprise, in short DVBE, and veterans hiring requirements. Sean from CalVet will discuss more about the supportive services plan and DVBE requirements. The last section is submitting a complete application. A complete application is vital in passing threshold. This is a snapshot of the document checklist from the application. The column on the right identifies which documents must be submitted with the application by the due date. The green check mark means the documents are pertaining to the project. And the red X mark indicates the documents are, are not applicable. Applicants must complete the entire application accurately to activate the indicators. Remember, during the threshold and scoring application review phases, no new, additional, or revised documentation will be accepted after the application due date. The application must be sufficient for the department to perform a thorough review and be complete pursuant to MHP guidelines, section 7318. This is the end of the threshold section. I will hand it over to Sean to go over the VIP supportive services plan. Well, thank you, Becky. Hello, uh, this is Sean Johnson, uh, CalVet uh, BHHP program manager. Uh, the information I'm going to cover today is relevant only to those uh, listeners who are interested in VHHP funding. While the uh, while much of the requirements and uh, much of the v, uh, VHHP program have aligned with MHP, as you've heard uh, before me, and you'll hear more about after I'm done, uh, the the requirements for lead service provider, supportive services plan, uh, DVBE utilization, and veteran hiring. Uh, remain unchanged. Uh, so for some, this will be a refresher. Nevertheless, uh, we want to thank you for your interest in supporting California veterans in need. Let's first talk about lead service provider. 
the VHHP program requires a lead service provider, and that uh, lead service provider will have overall responsibility for implementation of the supportive services plan. We require that the lead service provider have at least four years experience providing comprehensive case management uh, to individuals experiencing homelessness. Uh, two of those years must be associated with uh, supportive housing or transitional housing restricted to veterans um, in the last 10 years. The rest can be accounted for with area or tenant based case management programs such as SSVF or, or similar programs. The remaining two years can qualify uh, a lead service provider uh, through Section 201 L 1 B 2 in the guidelines. Uh, but if you're going to use that method to qualify, you must uh, show proof that there, that at least 20% of the veteran uh, occupants, 20% uh, 20, 20 of the occupancy was to veterans in those situations. Now let's talk about the supportive services plan. Um, in terms of uh, tenant screening and tenant selection requirements, you must include the specific criteria used to determine eligibility, such as income and homeless status, and you must also include the specific criteria that will lead to the rejection of tenancy applications while staying in line with housing first policy. We look, uh, we'll also look for the specific process for accepting referrals from the coordinated entry system or CES to include the CES and property management activities. Uh, in terms of the service delivery model practices, you must also include descriptions for the policies regarding the use of service delivery practices, the procedures or implementation of the practices, and a discussion of initial and periodic training plans. That means uh, training initial staff at, at, at hire and training uh, for staff on, on an ongoing basis. Uh, importantly, you must include you must also include how these practices will uh, will be used to specifically better uh, benefit the veteran population. Now, in terms of supportive services, we also uh, we also must see a clear and comprehensive supportive services plan that includes services provided to the veteran tenants that do not qualify for VA health care and also detailed plan for those who do qualify for VA uh, health care. Specifically, you must include a description that includes the frequency and objective of the service and you must also identify if the service is provided directly by the lead service provider or if it is a referral. You have to identify the direct service provider, their relationship to the, to the sponsor, and the type of agreement that is in place between the sponsor and that provider. You must also detail tra a transportation plan for accessing those off-site services. You must include letters of commitment or support letters uh, from the direct providers for the for all the services, including that from uh, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Those uh, these letters have to list the specific services provided for the services provided by the lead service provider. These services must be outlined in the formal agreement. We'll get a little get uh, to that in just a minute. In terms of supportive services coordination uh, or access to the services, you must provide a clear and comprehensive detail about how supportive services will be accessed by the tenants. This includes transportation provided at no cost to the veteran tenant who needs it for off-site minimum services and any other transportation assistance that's provided. You must also identify cultural, trauma-based, and disability related barriers to services and your strategies to mitigate those barriers. And we need a, a verification uh, of, the, of supportive services for VHHP, that is the USDVA support form that is embedded in the VHHP supported services plan. Uh, that, uh, that form should be reviewed and signed by the appropriate signatory from the local VA healthcare system for homeless programs or the VA Network Homeless Coordinator. In terms of supportive services engagement, uh, in this, and this includes safety and security, we require a description of the strategies to engage veterans in social interaction, building operations, and involvement in the community. 
We also require a description of the strategy to engage them in the in the in services planning and the delivery process, the delivery of services. Now, this includes both individual services and group services. We also require a description of the physical building design aspects and and support uh, the physical building design aspects that support the uh, social interaction and the provision of services, as well as the safety and security protocols for the, uh, of the residents taking into consideration the specific needs of the specific target populations that you will serve. We also require that tenant satisfaction surveys are administered at least annually. And we require a description of how the survey results will be made available to uh, veteran tenants. Finally, we require a description of the, uh, the safety and security policies and procedures considering also considering the specific needs of those target populations. Now, in terms of adequacy and uh, of the services, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the the uh, staffing chart and the services budget, uh, there is a staffing chart in the VHHP supported services plan. It must be completed and we require an adequate level of staffing or FTE full time equivalent um, that is outlined in the staffing chart. It's needed to satisfy the staffing ratio requirements. All committed staff. To, uh, needs to be listed in the staffing chart, including in kind variation, and that would be you know staff from the the VA that are committed to the project, or staff that are committed from local community based organizations or from county city uh, organizations that are committed to the project. We also require job descriptions be submitted for each staff position to verify the required experience and education listed in the guidelines. Those job descriptions must clearly identify the uh, yeah, education requirement for the position um, and the the level of experience um, and it and it must also indicate the intensity of staffing uh, uh, if that is relevant the services budget must also be adequate we must see the extent to which major services funding sources were accessed in the past additionally we require the services uh, the, a specific plan for filling gaps in funding during the life of the project we also include uh, the plan for filling gaps before the uh, project is kicked off. So both uh, in terms of securing funding initially and securing funding in the event that a major funding source is lost. In terms of uh, collaboration outcomes and evaluation, um, we uh, we require a plan uh, for we require a narrative description of the collaboration between the lead services provider or the sponsor and or owner and any contracted service providers. This will include specific and measurable outcomes for each veteran target population and specific measurable performance indicators. Finally, it will also include a plan for evaluation of the specific data used to measure outcomes, including the individual responsible for this, uh, this evaluation. Now, in terms of required support, uh, required supporting documentation for the supported services plan, um, there are several things that are required. First and foremost, a formal agreement between the sponsor and the lead service provider, which must be comprehensive and consistent with the supported services plan. Think of it as a formalization of that supported services plan. So all commitments and rel rel uh, relevant roles and responsibilities must be indicated in the formal agreement. Also, all commitment letters from the direct providers of minimum services must be submitted with your application. Uh, if you have similar commitment letters for the enhanced services that are listed in the guidelines as well, I'll go ahead and include that with your application, although those aren't necessary. The, enha the enhanced services commitment letters are not necessary at the time of application. We'll uh, circle around, get those from you at a later time. The job descriptions for all staff positions that are listed in the staffing chart is also uh, required at application. And that and again, that includes the education and experience required for the position and any veteran specific case management activities. The signed USDVA support form is also required at application and any uh, any executed public agency contracts for lead service provider eligibility so that we can verify the, the years of experience. We are looking for documentation to show relevant reporting to the to the public contracting agency. 
So now that's the supportive services plan. And now I'll transition over to the Disabled Veteran Business Enterprise or DVBE utilization requirement. Uh, some uh, it's for your application, you'll identify a single point of contact uh, that we call the DVBE plan administrator. So individual responsible uh, for uh, executing the plan to uh, meet the requirement. We also require the DVBE utilization plan to be submitted with, uh, with the application. This is a plan that will, uh, a plan to reach that 5% DVB utilization requirement. Uh, along the way, you'll also uh, be expected to submit um, construction reporting, pre-construction reporting before construction starts, post-construction reporting after construction ends. That will be the expectation should your, uh, should your project be awarded. And next and finally, the veterans hiring requirement. This is not a, a, a verified uh, requirement, so sponsors will make a good faith effort to hire veterans um, for the development, construction, and related jobs associated with the project. Uh, this can be the, the developer's organization, the general contractor, or any of the members of the development team. And that uh, plan will be submitted with your application. And uh, finally, you'll see our contact information at CalVet. Uh, my contact information is there. Uh, this, our, our team's uh, contact information is there, so feel free to Use that and contact us in the event that you have questions uh, regarding your application. We're happy to help. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over. Thank you, Sean. This is Gina Ferguson. Today, I will be discussing the second phase of application review, the universal scoring system. This scoring criteria chart provides a summary of the maximum points that can be obtained in each category. I will be going over highlights in each of these categories. The first scoring category is serving lowest income levels with the potential maximum points of 30. Points are awarded based on the percentage of units between 20 and 50% AMI or area median income. If a project is designated as rural as defined in Health and Safety Code, there are some points available at 55% AMI level. Please refer to the NOVA document for a table of point options at different AMI levels and different percentages of units. To receive any points, there is a minimum of 10% of restricted units at the 30% AMI level. This minimum does count towards points in the table. This slide shows a visual representation from the Supernova application's lowest income scoring table. In the scoring sheet of the application, cells will auto-populate point scoring based on inputs in the unit mix sheet of the application. The more units in a lower area median income, the higher the point options available to a project for a maximum of 30 points. State policy priorities provides location-based sites and population targeting. For location, there are points for sites located in higher highest resource areas and points for developing affordable housing on excess state-owned property. To qualify for excess state land points, the site must have been selected to enter into a ground lease prior to the application submission. There is a web page on the HCV website that provides additional information about how to um, qualify, obtain, and enter into this ground lease for public access lands. For population targeting, up to 10 points are available for setting aside units to assist special needs households, including homeless households and or agricultural households. As a little background for the high and highest resource area site points, which many of you may not need. The opportunity area maps were developed a few years ago and were first published in 2018 to identify locations that have higher quality economic, health, and educational opportunities. There is a methodology with the criteria. There is information on the website to describe this, and later in the presentation, Kona will provide a link for that. Locations are identified with designations of highest, high, moderate, low, and high segregation and poverty on a map that is available on the website. 
point category provides five points for sites located in high and highest resource areas. And on the map, these are designated in a color coded manner. Uh, there's also available the ability on the map to type in an address and the map will zoom in on the location and provide information about the resource area type. For these points, there is a soft cap similar to what has been proposed for the SILAC scoring system for later in the 2022 year. For this soft cap for the supernova, this means that high and highest resource area sites will have a five point advantage until 50% of the NOFA funds have been assigned to projects located in these resource areas. These high and highest resource area points are available to most project types and all construction types. By construction types, I mean new construction, rehabilitation, and conversion or adaptive reuse. Senior projects do not qualify for high and highest resource area points unless they are they also qualify as special needs projects. This is to help ensure that senior project types, which may be easier to have approved for funding in high and highest resource areas, are not disproportionately awarded. There are up to 10 points available for setting aside units to assist special needs households, including homeless households and or agricultural households. We have a visual of this um, on this table on this slide. For this point option, rehabilitation projects must meet certain criteria to be able to access these points. First, the project qualifies either as at high risk or involves the conversion of single occupancy units without kitchen, kitchens and or bathrooms to units with kitchens and bathrooms. And secondly, the contract for rehabilitation work must equal or exceed 60,000 per unit in hard construction costs. Also under this category um, for rehabilitation points projects, um, if you meet the above the, the criteria that I just listed and that, that is summarized on this slide, um, pro those projects will automatically receive 10 points. Um, to receive these points, um, if the projects currently have regulatory restrictions for homeless, special needs, and agricultural populations, um, those restrictions must be maintained um, after receipt of points. No permanent location is permitted unless um, reviewed and approved by the department. And the reasoning for having these automatic rehabilitation points is that we are uh, we want to discourage displacement of existing tenants. Next scoring category: sponsor and applicant experience um, and property management experience. This category provides points for development, ownership, and management experience. There are 15 points available for development and ownership, and five points for property management. And negative points are determined as well, and we'll talk about some more about these the components of this point, point category over the next couple of slides. For development and ownership experience, the applications will be scored based on the number of affordable rental housing projects that the sponsor has completed and operated. For applications requesting IIG program funds only, applicant experience is evaluated. For applications requesting IIG plus another designated program fund, such as MHP, applicant experience is evaluated for IIG and sponsor experience is evaluated for MHP. In most cases, those two entities will be um, similar, the same entity, but in if you are anticipating a project where the IIG applicant and the MHP sponsor or another program sponsor are two separate unrelated entities, um, that your project will be evaluated for experience points for each of those entities. For a sponsor applicant to receive maximum experience points, the projects that are being evaluated for experience must total at least 11 units each. They must have been operating for more than three years. One must have been operating um, for more than five years. And then of these projects, they must include at least two that have HC or TCAP regulatory restrictions. 
There is an option for some applications to receive these points with one less project, meaning the projects developed for experienced children four rather than five. This point option is for special needs projects and or community based developers. You can see based on this slide, this criteria are similar but slightly different. Um, the minimum three year experience requirement is. Is also required here. Um, however, the five year experience requirement um, does not apply for this particular option. Um, and then they must also include one a project that has TCAC or CIDLAC, I'm sorry, HCV or TCAC regulatory restrictions. There is a required self certification that the projects for which points are requested have maintained fiscal integrity for the year in which each project's last financial statement was prepared. The certification confirms that these projects have had positive cash flow from residential income and have funded reserves in accordance with the ownership entities partnership or operating agreement and also any reserve requirements in loan documents. There are five points available for property management experience to receive maximum experience points for property management. The property management company must have maintained at least 11 projects for more than three years. These also must include at least two that have HC or TCAP regulatory restrictions. And an executed property management agreement is required to be submitted with the application. Similar to the sponsor applicant experience category, there is a less, lesser threshold for special needs projects and or community based developers in the property management category. Five points are available for either special needs projects that have four or more special needs projects in service, one in three years, or for community based developers with four or more projects in service at least three years. And again, one must be at least an H, at least one must be regulated by HCP or TCAP. And the same property management agreement requirement applies. For the project readiness scoring category, so oh, Apologies, Oops. we still need to cover negative points. An application's experience will be reduced by any assessed negative points. Negative points will be assessed upon receipt of an application for HCV funding based on the policy criteria, the negative, pol negative points policy criteria that Hector reviewed earlier. Applicants will have an opportunity to appeal the assessment of any negative points. For complete information, please to review the policy, which is on HCP's website, and also the NOFA's appeal section. If a sponsor or applicant is subject to negative points assessment based on the criteria outlined in the policy, HCP will notify that sponsor or applicant in writing in the point score letter and provide information on the ability to appeal. We strongly recommend that you contact HCP Asset Management and Compliance Branch prior to submitting an application so that you can resolve these issues before an application is submitted. These events will not result in the deduction of points if they have been fully resolved as of the application date. Project readiness. This is a 20 point category with four components, two related to financing, one related to land and entitlements and environmental clearance, and one related to the ultimate borrower entity. Enforceable funding commitments are required for all construction and permanent financing to receive points. There are five points available for construction financing and five points available for permanent financing. This does exclude a tax credit reservation and bond allocation. Those, those are not required to be committed to receive these points. And to further clarify, we're requiring the commitment letter for the bond lender but not the SIDLAC allocation commitment. If you have been awarded additional HCD department funds previously, please provide us with that award letter that will help speed up the review process and confirm that award. If you have not been awarded funds, but are including those funds in the application as you expect to be imminently awarded funding at the conclusion of the supernova rating and ranking process, um, please ensure that um, when that award is received, you forward that information to the Supernova team through the Supernova mailbox. If that commitment 
does not end up being awarded, then it will be considered not committed and points will not be received. So there are seven points available total for land use approvals, five points for obtaining all required land use approvals or entitlements necessary prior to issuance of a building permit, including discretionary approvals. There are two other lesser point options available if you are in the approval process but don't quite meet this standard. There is a four point option and a one point option, and those are further described in the NOVA. There are two points available for local certification of CEQA exemption or completion. And just to note, NEPA verification is not required for this project readiness scoring category. If you have federal funds and NEPA is invoked, then you will expect to see the NEPA clearance documentation um, at the time of the construction closing. And then lastly, there are three points available for fully forming the ultimate borrower entity and or the IIG recipient and providing documentation of this in the application. The next scoring category uh, totals 21 points and you can see it has four components, adaptive reuse and infill, proximity to amenities, broadband access and sustainable building methods. I'll be going over those in the next few slides. Infill development and net density, five points for infill development, including adaptive reuse of a vacant and underutilized non-residential building. To receive these points, an application must meet one of the following, a minimum percent of the site either previously improved or adjoining parcels with urban uses, or developed at an average residential net density. For both of these components, the NOFA further describes the minimum percent and the average with average density requirements. There are different density criteria for whether you're located in a metropolitan or a non-metropolitan. So for these, for this point option, please do refer the NOVA for complete details. Proximity to amenities, there are six points available with two separate categories. Projects will receive one third point per site amenity point that would be awarded under TCAC regulations up to a five point maximum. Separately, projects within one quarter of a mile of a transit station or major transit stop are eligible to receive one point. For this one point category, these transit points are measured by a walkable route. The applicant must submit an amenities list and a project area map. On this slide, we have an example. The amenities list must include the name of the amenity, the address, distance from the project and the points. And here's an example of the project area map illustrating the amenities and distance from the project. For broadband access points, residential dwelling units must accommodate broadband service with at least a speed of 100 megabits per second and 20 for downloading and 20 megabits per second for uploading with lesser thresholds for rural sites. Payment of internet service and its ongoing fee is not a requirement. And then the application must include a plan for reducing barriers to internet access for project residents. The sustainable building method point option has a maximum of five points. There are 2.5 point options, three point, uh, a, three, a three point option, and several five point options. The 2.5 options include sustainable community strategy or alternate planning strategy, a regional plan that includes policies and programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and also a project in which not less than 50% of the land area is within a transit priority area as defined in guidelines appendix A. Five points can be obtained for building to full electrification or three points for near electrification. And by electrification, we mean that gas is not piped into the project site. So for the green building program options, these are all each are five point options. You can see the table listed gives you the program and the minimum tier designation. We are asking for a self certification in the application. Uh, and then the actual certificate 
of the program um, will be re required after construction is complete. Our last scoring category, the cost containment point category, compares project total development costs to the county average, adjusting for unit size and AMI targeting. The SuperNOFA application will calculate the score automatically based on inputs you make in the development budget, the unit mix, and the high cost verification sheet of the Excel application. A project will receive one point for each full percent that the project's eligible basis is less than the project's adjusted threshold basis limit, up to a maximum of five points. We have a few slides um, to go over this calculation. So here, this is a visual representation of where eligible basis is input in the Excel application. Eligible basis, as a very basic definition, are those development budget costs that are depreciable. So for example, eligible basis would include most of the project cost, but would exclude items such as land and any monetary funds such as reserve account funding in the budget. This is a visual representation of where the adjusted threshold basis limit is calculated in the Excel application. The threshold basis limit is a standard by which a project's development cost is measured against an average cost or similar affordable housing project of the same unit mix calculated by county. The limit can be adjusted or increased by selecting from a list of items that add to the denominator. And you can see here, um, we have a snippet of the adjustments on this screen. There are more, if you go to this sheet in the application, you'll see the full uh, menu. This calculation is done in the high cost verification sheet of the application. And you can review the list of options and select those that apply for the table on the high cost verification sheet of the application. This is a visual representation of how cost containment is calculated in the Excel application. You can see it uh, circled in red, the 40 million from a previous slide and the adjusted threshold basis limit of 50.8 million at the bottom of this slide. The cost containment calculation increases the denominator by the number of units at or below 50% AMI with a higher level of increase for units at or below 35% AMI. And those are the gray or rest, or I'm sorry, the orange or rest circled items. You can see that the 50.8 million is being increased to 82.8 million by way of these AMI adjustments to the denominator. And finally, the tiebreaker. In the event that projects are ranked with identical point scores, HCD will evaluate these applications based on three factors, weighted average affordability, local funding, and cost efficiency. The weighted average affordability takes into account the area median income affordability of a project's unit mix. For this calculation, units are adjusted by bedroom size, so larger bedroom sizes are weighted more than smaller bedroom sizes. In addition, there are some established floors and limits on which units can be calculated at the 30% AMI level, which is the lowest AMI level for purposes of the tiebreaker. Only units with project-based rental assistance will be evaluated at a 30% AMI level. For all others, the lowest AMI possible is 40% of area median income. The SuperNOFA application will calculate this factor based on inputs made in the unit mix sheet of the application. The local funding factor provides tiebreaker advantage for the leverage of local public funds, including land donations and fee waivers to be used in permanent funding. These are calculated as a percent of the total project development cost. This calculation also includes a value attributable to public project-based rental or operating subsidy. The application will calculate this factor based on inputs made in the development sources and unit mix sheets of the application. And finally, there's a cost efficiency factor that is calculated just as the cost efficiency point category, which we just reviewed. Percentages of cost efficiency used for point scoring are not part of the tiebreaker calculation, and there is a maximum of 25% for this factor. This factor also is weighted at a lesser degree than the other two factors. And this concludes the review of scoring criteria and the tiebreaker.
Hello, my name is Shirley Chavez, and I'll be guiding you through, fe through feasibility, the third and final phase of the application review. When determining the total development costs, please make sure the total amount in the budget matches the total amount of the permanent funding sources. The department will lower the amount of the requested program funds if the funding sources exceed the development costs. There is a high cost verification calculator as part of the application. If the high cost exceeds 160%, an explanation is required and may result in disqualification. When reviewing the development budget, verify the following. Contractor overhead and profit cannot exceed 14% of the cost of site work and structures excluding builder's general liability insurance. Hard cost contingencies should be a minimum of 5% for new construction projects and a minimum of 10% for acquisition rehabilitation projects. If the amount provided is greater or less than the minimum requirement, a letter of explanation or comments must be provided. There are costs that may be included in other line items or have multiple costs included in a single line item. We ask that you separate each cost. If for some reason the amount cannot be separated, it should be explained in the comment section. Some examples of these costs include prevailing wages, accounting, miscellaneous items. Please note prevailing wages are different than prevailing wage monitoring. The department will verify that these items do not, any, do not include any ineligible uses of funds. Anytime an other cost is added, remove specifying parentheses and identify the cost. Additionally, if there are multiple costs included in a single line item, please separate the amounts in the comment section located at the bottom of the development budget and sources and uses. The following slides are applicable for loans and may not be required for grants. An operating reserve is required to cover operating shortfalls resulting from department approved operating expenses exceeding operating income beyond the rent up period. Operating reserves are calculated from replacement reserves, non-contingent debt service, and projected operating expenses, excluding the cost of on-site supportive service coordination. For tax credit projects, the department requires three months reserves, and non-tax credit projects require four months reserves. If the department budget includes a reserve that exceeds the amount required by the department, the reason for the excess amount must be explained in the comment section as shown here. Transition reserves are required when a development utilizes project-based rental assistance. In the event the rental assistance contract is terminated, Program requires the reserve must be sufficient to prevent rent increases for one year after the rental assistance ends. If the project includes other department funds, the transition reserve will be underwritten to the most restrictive program. For example, no place like home requires two years of sufficient reserves after the rental assistance ends. For more information, see the MHP guidelines section 7312 F2 for this requirement. The department will review the operating budget for the following but not limited to the employee information section, bookkeeping accounting services, 0.42% annual mandatory debt service for each HCD loan, annual bond issuer fee, mandatory debt service. In previous rounds, applications were submitted without completing the following, number of employees, FTE, payroll taxes, workers' compensation, employee benefits. I want to point these out as they are the most 
common items missed in the application. Please make sure payroll taxes, workers' compensation, and employee benefits are listed separately. For the employee unit section, be sure to include the job title, unit type, and square footage. Please be sure to complete the Supportive Services Cost Calculator tab in the application. The amount listed in the operating budget as total supportive services costs should be equal or less than the maximum amount as shown on the service calculator. The supportive services cost calculator is the same across all programs. However, the multiplier may differ. For projects that have VIP or MHP funds and the service plan budget includes costs paid from project operations, then this amount should be in the supportive services cost line items in the operating budget. The amounts in both budgets must match. Remember to remove the specifying parentheses and identify the other supportive services costs if they apply. For other types of operating reserve, include documentation or letter of explanation, which includes the following. The purpose of the reserve, the source and the amount of the funding, the terms for disbursement, including the first year disbursement amount. The most common other types of operating reserves include, but are not limited to, the ones listed in the box. If your project has any of these types of reserves, an EFC should be provided with the application submission. Replacement reserves cover the cost of repairing or replacing failed or damaged capital items and to cover extraordinary maintenance expenses as approved by the department. For new construction, it is a lesser of 0.6% of the estimated construction costs which excludes construction contingency, general contractor profit, overhead, and general requirements, or $500 per unit. For rehabilitation, it is initially $500 per unit and is subject to change at permanent loan closing. Finance expenses should include mandatory debt. Mandatory debts include amortized loans. As a reminder, balloon payments are not allowed on senior debt, except where the department's regulatory agreement is recorded in a senior position to the debt with a balloon payment. Balloon payments are allowed on junior debt during the term of the program loan, only where the department determines that the balloon payment will not jeopardize project feasibility. Mandatory debts also include the 0.42% annual debt service and the bond issuer fee. These amounts must be included in the finance expense section of the operating budget. Remember to include the annual debt service for any additional HCD loans separately. Asset management, partnership management, and similar fees must not exceed the amount allowed per UMR 8314 B1 for the current year of 2022, the amount allowed is $36,878. For projects with proposed rents, please select the proposed rents drop down as illustrated here on the cash flow analysis. The application will be underwritten by the department using restricted rents and the regulatory agreement will reflect proposed rents. The project will need to be feasible under both the proposed rents and restricted rents. The project must demonstrate positive cash flow for 15 or 20 years, depending on the more restrictive program requirements, utilizing assumptions of an annual 2.5% increase in gross income and a 3.5% increase in operating expenses. The first year debt service coverage ratio should not be less than 1.10 or greater than 1.20. Residual receipts and sponsor distributions are paid 
the department may share with other public entity lenders the residual receipts on a pro rata basis. Keep in mind, residual receipt payments are not allowed on land donation or ground leases. Please note, sponsor loans are paid from the sponsor's distribution. That concludes this section on feasibility. Thank you, Shirley, for the feasibility presentation. My name is Conant Radcliffe. I'll be concluding the presentation by covering the application submittal process. I'll also be listing some resources that may assist you in your application preparation. Multifamily Supernova applications are submitted through the Supernova application portal known as SNAP by ServiceNow. You'll find the link to ServiceNow on the HCD Supernova website. Once you connect to the HCD Supernova website, you'll see an orange banner. You'll click on apply in the orange banner. You can get more information on SNAP and the application process by clicking on how to apply. If you previously submitted HCD applications using ServiceNow, the system will have your login information. If this is your first time using ServiceNow, you'll click on register in the upper right hand corner. Once you've logged on to ServiceNow, look for a drop down menu in the upper right hand corner labeled requests. Then choose Request Something from the drop down menu. After you've selected Request Something, then select the Supernova Application Portal. The Supernova Application Portal enables you to submit your application and all required documents. But just to recap, the application submittal process includes going to the HCD website registering with ServiceNow, then connecting to the SNAP portal. When you're completing tabs in the portal, please note that all fields with a red asterisk are required fields. You'll enter information in the fields with a red asterisk to complete your application submission. You'll be unable to proceed until all required fields are complete. Toward the top of the portal, you'll see the MHP, the Multifamily Housing Program, the IIG, the Infill Infrastructure Grant Program, the VHIP, the Veterans Housing and Homelessness Prevention Program, and the Joe Cerna Farm Worker Housing Grant Program. You'll see those in the in this portal in this uh, slide right here. In the menu, there is a there's a drop down menu beneath each program, and in the menu, select yes for all programs that are included in your project. Select no for all programs that aren't included in the project. When you're finished, click save and continue. Once you've determined which programs are in your project, you're ready to start attaching documents to the application. For each section in the attachments tab, you'll find boxes requesting documents. These boxes all correspond with the document checklist in the application. You can drag and drop attachments in the appropriate portal boxes You'll need to fill in all required document boxes in order to submit your application. If you haven't filled in all boxes with the red asterisk, you'll be unable to submit your application. You can save the attachments in the portal by clicking on save at the top. 
When you're ready to submit your application and required documents, click the Submit Application option on the Activity tab. You'll see a submitted on date at the top of the screen. The submit application isn't showing you haven't submitted all required documents. Again, you want to move the required documents to the boxes that have red asterisks. If you submitted your application, then decide to add additional documents. You can add attachments by clicking on requests, then HCD applications. There you'll see a list of applications identified by number and project name. You click on your application. Then you'll see a screen that enables you to add documents. If you can't find your project, you can search by entering your application number or project name in the keyword search box. To deliver a complete application, you must submit the multifamily supernova Excel application and all required supporting documents to the SNAP portal. You can add to the submitted application up until 4 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time on June 28, 2022. If you'd like to add attachments, select Add more attachments from the activity tab. Your application package must be submitted through SNAP. Wet signatures are no longer required as part of the submittal process. The complete application should be uploaded and submitted by Tuesday, June 28 at 4 p.m. Late submissions will not be accepted, and there are no exceptions. Please be aware the SNAP online support and help desk closes at 5 p.m. We expect a high degree of competition for the Supernova funds. Your application will be evaluated solely upon the materials contained within your submission. Applications must meet all eligibility requirements, be organized properly, be complete and in compliance with program regulations and guidelines. Remember, no late applications will be accepted under any circumstances. It's also important to note that the information included in your application becomes a public record, which is available for review by the public. By submitting your application, you're waiving any claim of confidentiality. You're also consenting to the disclosure of all material upon request. Please only provide information specifically requested within the application. That concludes the application submittal section. The following few slides provide links to resource tools that may assist you further. You can sign up for email updates on the HCD website. Here you see the link to the HCD website. You can click on contact in the top bar, then click on e email sign up at the bottom to enter your email address and contact information. You can follow HCD on social media. Here are the handles for social media. Here are links to the Multifamily Supernova website, the 2021 TCAC regulations, a methodology for determining rural status, the TCAC HCD opportunity area maps, 
and the California Government Code. Additional questions may be sent to the multifamily supernova mailbox. It's supernova at hcd.ca.gov. That concludes our multifamily supernova presentation. We're going to turn it over to our section chief, Lynn Jones. Thank you, Cohen, for your overview of the Supernova application portal. The Multifamily Finance Supernova application workbook has been released and is available on our webpage. The department intends to release a separate standalone recorded presentation covering application specific details. This presentation will be available the week of May 23rd, 2022. As well, please ensure you are signed up to receive mass communications from the department by visiting our website, as Conant has mentioned. Contact us, input your email address and what list serves you would like to receive communications from so you can stay up to date with information as the department releases it. Again, on behalf of the department, of Housing and Community Development. We thank you for watching and look forward to working with you on your upcoming applications. Have a great rest of your day.